Hello and welcome to this episode of China Edge brought to you by the SubChina team. I'm your host, Lizzie, an MIT trained economist turned journalist here at Wall Street TV who covers China and its relation to the world. At China Edge, we go beyond the headlines and guide you, our audience, through the jungle of Chinese regulations. We go deep into industry trends and identify challenges and opportunities in the Chinese market. How should companies navigate the low tides of the US China relationship? Joining me today is Craig Allen. President of the U.S. China Business Council, Ambassador Allen, thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you for this opportunity. So, Ambassador Allen, in general, how would you describe the current business environment in China for your members? What's sort of the top of the list of concerns for them? So, for American companies that are invested in China,、uh, there has been、uh, some pretty significant changes over the last year, and、uh, the largest concern is certainly、uh, uncertainty associated. Uh, with the dynamic zero COVID policy,、uh, companies are trying to adjust their supply chains.、Uh, they're trying to adjust production schedules. They're trying to work with uh, uh, ports and trucking, and uh, uh, consumption uh, uh, obviously had taken a hit. That may be recovering now.、Uh, a second、uh, major change、uh, has been uh, Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and the potential spillover effects that that could have on American companies doing business、uh, in China, and I would rush to say that the Chinese government has been disciplined about how it has、uh, respected the sanctions regimes put into place by、uh, Brussels and Washington. But that said, there is an additional de- degree of uncertainty here uh, that uh, has uh, that did not exist、uh, prior to. The February fourth、uh, agreement between Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, and that changes、uh, companies' perceptions uh, and risk um, uh, horizon, uh, particularly in、uh, the high tech、uh, sector.、Uh, a third factor that we're watching very closely is、um, China's economy.、Uh, there are stresses in China's economy. It is uh, uh, pretty clear that there is a longer term slowdown. Uh, and that、uh, slowdown will affect investment decisions.、Uh, none of us know、um, exactly uh, how uh, deep uh, the slowdown will be,、uh, where it will be felt, felt、uh, the industrial or the regional implications of the slowdown. Uh, but uh, there is a slowdown, and I think that henceforth,、uh, looking uh, forward to, to the next ten or or twenty years. Three to four、uh, percent growth、uh, from China would probably be、uh, about right.、Uh, five to six percent growth would be probably、uh, projections would probably be excessively optimistic. That, of course, affects um, investment um, intentions. So uh, overall, uh, U.S. companies uh, remain um, dedicated and committed、uh, to the China China market.、Uh, investment is probably continuing. Uh, but uh, at the same time,、um, the marginal increase in investment is、uh, is looking at other countries、uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, possibly Europe, uh, possibly uh, Mexico, and so companies are are looking at diversifying their supply chains and reducing、uh, dependence on any single uh, source uh, 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 of supply. Uh, if that、uh, if that single supplier happens to be well, really anywhere, but、uh, specifically in China,、uh, companies want resilience、uh, in their supply chain, and、uh, they are investing accordingly. Based on your experience interacting with Chinese officials and various bureaucracies in in China, how would you describe Beijing's attitude toward U.S. businesses or foreign business businesses in general? Is China still open for business for the United States? Do you get the sense that China's reform and opening model is undergoing some kind of a fundamental change? So、um, I think that it, there's kind of、uh, two sides of that coin.、Um, and on the bright side of the coin,、uh, what we see is a tremendous welcome and、uh, indeed attention to the needs of foreign investors、uh, in China. And、uh, we could take the、uh, adapting to COVID、uh, as an example. Uh, I think that、uh, while the dynamic zero COVID policy is being enforced uh, uh, very uh, sy- systematically, city government officials and provincial government officials are attentive、uh, to supply chain needs and are working、uh, directly with、uh, 
American and, and other companies to ensure that uh, uh, business operations are uh, minimally disrupted. And, and we appreciate uh, uh, that uh, support. And at the same time, there's a, a lot of competition between uh, the various uh, provinces and cities uh, for uh, foreign direct investment. And uh, uh, that creates an environment that uh, also uh, we welcome. Uh, let's turn the coin over, though, and, and look at the other uh, elements here. I think that uh, the, the uh, Chinese uh, government has made it very clear that self-sufficiency is uh, a high priority. And uh, we are very unclear uh, about what that means for foreign direct investment. Um, and is uh, uh, China's WTO obligations uh, would require uh, the Chinese government to treat an imported product the same as a domestically produced product, uh, be it by a Chinese company or a foreign company. But when you look at uh, the dual circulation policy or this emphasis uh, on self-reliance, it is clear uh, that uh, those obligations are not being uh, implemented in a fulsome uh, manner. Uh, it is clear uh, as we look at um, uh, industrial policies and particularly where the money is flowing in terms of industrial uh, subsidies, uh, that uh, the Chinese government is, is trying uh, to uh, reduce um, uh, dependence on imports uh, and to build up uh, domestic uh, capacity. Um, and uh, so many foreign companies are looking at their Chinese competitors and the degree to which they're receiving benefits from the government and wondering uh, if, uh, is this really a level playing field? Uh, can we uh, obtain uh, the same types of benefits? Uh, uh, and what is our longer term uh, future uh, in China? So I think that uh, on the one hand, uh, local provincial governments are providing uh, uh, really very substantial, uh, substantial support. And at the same time, the central government uh, is engaged in a self-reliance policy that calls into question wh whether or not um, foreign companies are uh, welcome uh, in China over the longer term. And so there's a, a balance here that foreign companies uh, are, are, are making. Um, and uh, different companies are coming out with different conclusions. Right. And speaking of this balancing act, we've heard a lot of talks in the media about reshoring and French shoring uh, supply chains away from Chinese suppliers to hedge against the potential uh, geopolitical risks. Do you observe that actually happening on the ground? Can you sort of help us understand to what extent American businesses rely on Chinese suppliers and what are the associated vulnerabilities and efficacy gains? So it's a it's a complex question uh, with uh, many elements. And uh, I think that uh, uh, the dynamic zero COVID policy has uh, trained us uh, quite well uh, to beware of a single source of uh, failure uh, anywhere around the world. Uh, if uh, a factory is locked down uh, in China and that there is no alternative source of supply anywhere in the world, then uh, a company is in trouble. And uh, I know of a number of companies that have had to uh, hold up major uh, global uh, industrial um, uh, plans uh, as, a re as a result of uh, the dynamic zero COVID policy. There are also uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, which uh, uh, and and the sanctions uh, that the United States and the Europeans have imposed on Russian companies is uh, is something that we watch very closely. And all of our companies in China are also active in Russia, so they have personal experience here. Um, and so uh, companies are uh, more conservative than they had been in the past about a uh, single point of failure in China or anywhere else uh, around the world. Uh, and therefore, what I would uh, summarize, and you could go industry by industry and really come out with different uh, analysis. Uh, but in summary, um, I would say that marginal dollars uh, are going uh, to uh, uh, markets and, and supply bases outside of China while at the same time, companies are continuing to try and build up, expand, strengthen their In China for China program uh, and uh, thereby uh, reduce 
uh, as much as possible the probability of a global disruption as a result of a zero dynamic uh, uh, COVID China uh, shutdown uh, or uh, elimination of a, a supply, specific source of supply. So all companies are placing more emphasis on supply chain resiliency. Um, but we need to be very cautious about that, uh, that there needs to be, uh, yet again, a balance between supply chain resiliency and supply chain efficiency. Uh, so if you're the most resilient, uh, uh, if you have a very resilient supply chain, you could still go out of business uh, if it's not uh, efficient. Then okay. if competitors are able uh, to underprice you significantly on a global basis. So this is a uh, complex uh, dynamic uh, and one that is um, uh, changing r literally on a month by month basis uh, for many of our companies. Great. And finally, I wanted to turn to policy a little bit. As a former diplomat, how would you assess the Biden administration's policy towards China? Are there specific suggestions or areas of improvement you would like to propose to the Biden administration? Oh, well, we have many suggestions for improvement. Uh, but uh, I uh, would give uh, the Biden administration um, high marks uh, for engaging constructively with the Chinese government. Uh, I believe that there's been three uh, uh, summit meetings, uh, there's been multiple meetings at a, at a lower level, yet uh, we don't see a lot of emphasis on uh, uh, the issues that are of greatest uh, concern to us, which are mostly market access uh, issues, um, uh, intellectual property rights, uh, government procurement, uh, industrial standards, uh, subsidies, state-owned enterprise, uh, cyber uh, customs procedures uh, and 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 many others, uh, and I think that uh, uh, right now uh, the Biden administration really has not been effectively engaged uh, with uh, the Chinese government on uh, these market access uh, issues, and uh, rather they're uh, in kind of a a quiet period uh, in which uh, both sides are evaluating the other. Uh, and uh, engaging with third parties. Uh, so the United States has, uh, with the Europeans, have established the US-EU Trade and Technology Council. Uh, with the Asia Pacific, they have established uh, uh, the um, Asia Pacific Economic Framework uh, Agreement. Um, but these don't address uh, market access problems uh, in China uh, directly. And so we would encourage a more fulsome engagement with the Chinese government uh, on these issues. And I would note that um, previously, uh, within uh, the phase one agreement, a lot of progress had been made on these issues. And if you look at the comprehensive agreement on investment with the EU, for example, um, a lot of progress was made on these same issues, mm -hmm. uh, but they have not been implemented or, uh, uh, if you will, uh, announced or even acknowledged uh, by the Chinese government. And we think that uh, uh, bringing uh, Chinese uh, regulatory practice more into compliance with uh, CPTPP or uh, WTO uh, standards would be highly beneficial uh, for China's trading partners and also would increase growth uh, and uh, prosperity uh, in China. There are win-wins here uh, available. Uh, with uh, more rigorous uh, application of market principles uh, that, uh, and, and that growth uh, that would come from uh, greater uh, market uh, reliance uh, uh, is uh, becoming more and more necessary. So we're hopeful that, uh, that both sides can engage in pragmatic discussions on the real issues that business uh, workers uh, farmers, ranchers, and families uh, are, are, are addressing. And a lot of progress uh, could be made uh, if one were just to take a pragmatic, uh, market-oriented uh, uh, approach to this and uh, to perhaps structure those, that dialogue uh, in terms of uh, mutual WTO commitments and or uh, CPTPP uh, standards which China has said it wishes to uh, adopt. So I think that there is a pathway forward here, uh, but uh, the pathway uh, 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 it seems to be quite long 
uh, and it may be arduous, uh, but uh, both uh, governments need economic growth. Both governments uh, need uh, more uh, market competition uh, and both governments uh, need to stabilize uh, the overall bilateral relationship and uh, doing this uh, through better economic management would be uh, a very good way to move forward. Mommy. Do you get the sense that they are receptive to your suggestions? How responsive are they to the U.S. business community? I, I think that um, the Chinese uh, government uh, is pragmatic uh, and looking uh, for ways uh, to boost growth. And the government uh, of China, or at least the economists within the government of China, understand uh, that uh, a number of recent actions have uh, reduced growth and have led uh, to a quite alarming increase in youth unemployment, uh, for, for example, and that there's significant regional stresses within the, and, and industrial stresses. So if you were look, to look at the Northeast, uh, or if you were to look at the real estate sector, uh, for, for example, or uh, the online uh, sector, there's a lot of stress. Um, and uh, I won't say that, uh, that market principles will cure all, I, that would be naive. Uh, but uh, using market principles as a, uh, a, as a way to measure the efficacy of policy uh, is it, very useful. So I think a lot of pragmatic uh, economists uh, in China definitely would agree on the need for greater uh, transparency, uh, on the need for uh, greater uh, competition, uh, within uh, industries that are dominated by state-owned enterprises, on the internationalization of standards, uh, on a more um, uh, transparent uh, uh, and uh, internationally oriented public procurement program at the central government level and at the provincial and municipal government level, um, and uh, at the need uh, for uh, and the desirability uh, of um, economic interdependence rather than self-reliance. Um, that uh, an excessive uh, call for self-reliance is going to be very expensive and very inefficient, and that there uh, are partners and uh, um, companies out there that, uh, that can be relied upon uh, to, uh, to contribute uh, to China's growth if they are welcome to do so. And uh, so uh, within China's uh, government, as in the U.S. government, there's a huge debate going on over these issues, and we're hopeful that uh, the debate will come out on the pro-growth, uh, pro-economic integration, uh, pro-prosperity uh, uh, program uh, that uh, not only China really needs, but uh, the global economy really needs. Uh, the implications of uh, slow growth uh, in China on uh, the global uh, economy would be quite significant. And so hopefully we have a pathway uh, forward, even though it might be quite long and arduous. Hi, this is Lizzie, host of the China Edge show. We have prepared both English and Chinese subtitles for the show. You can turn on subtitles by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of your YouTube video. Click on the gear icon and select from one of the three languages, English, Chinese Simplified, and Chinese Traditional. 大家好，这里是李琦。在China for watching. You can find out more about China's business and economic landscape by subscribing to our newsletter, joining our premium Chinese business intelligence database, and of course, watching this show. Find out how to do all of that in the summary section of this video.